Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for rescheduling quite flexibly this cross-border seminar because those that were on the initial list to speak on the 26th or 7th, we all got very scared. <laughs> and um, in fact, the, for those who don't know the Swiss Finance Council, um, we are a joint venture between Credit Suisse and UBS and we were set up to foster international dialogue and I like line that QED has chosen, which is promoting European dialogue, and I can you tell you we're even more ambitious. We want to promote international dialogue. And this is, of course, quite obvious because um, Credit Suisse and UBS are international global players. Um, they happen to be based in Switzerland, but they are subject to many jurisdictions. And of course, when you're a small, open, and extremely innovative economy, you are reliant to, uh, you are dependent on the international regulatory framework and you want, of course, to have as much coherence as possible. And that was the original thought when uh, the Swiss Finance Council was set up. And as um, Sean has already um, alluded to and also Brian uh, earlier, time have moved, has moved on quite quickly and things have changed. And um, we have to rethink this, but I think we have to hang on to this idea that we need to promote international dialogue and that we also want to promote European dialogue. And before actually uh, starting to talk about cross-border, I think we need to maybe make a little difference between cross-border and cross-border because we, of we also have European cross-border business. Um, and the international cross-border business is actually the dimension that we can embrace after the European cross-border. Dimension. And I think we need to focus first on what is happening in the European cross-border dimension, which is and continues to be difficult. And for those that have been around long enough to have seen uh, the birth of the second coordination banking directive, uh, where you probably will remember we put aside um, our differences, we decided to trust home and host supervisors on the premise that we were going to harmonize own funds requirements, large exposure, uh, deposit guarantees, and that gave the host authority the trust in the home authority. But for the very beginning, there was this problem with general good. Why was that? It's because inside the European Union, the member states still wanted to protect their retail consumers and retail investors. And I think Eric de Colombier at the time has written a, a communication, I think it was in 1997, of 15 pages on the interpretation of the general good in the context of the second coordination banking directive. So this issue is at the heart of a lot of trust between us. And you will see this issue as to what is the power of the state to protect its citizens this is an issue that is recurrent and that you will find in a number of uh, instances also when you go beyond the cross-border element, uh, the European cross-border element into the international element. Were member states right to do this? I think the crisis showed yes, they were right to be worried about not only their consumers but also their investor protection. And hence, I think what we see today more and more is that there is a segregation also in terms of some of the equivalence provision between um, what you're allowed to do in a cross-border context in terms of reaching out. And some of the equivalence um, um, rules that we've seen is that there is already a segmentation between the wholesale market as opposed to the retail market. And there are probably good reasons to do this. Now, in Europe, we've made a lot of progress. You know, we have the banking union. Uh, we don't um, have such a strong integration yet with when it comes to capital and securities markets, but I think we're moving in that direction. And actually, we've made a lot of progress sa since the second coordination banking directive. And I think also when you hear some of the work that ESMA is doing and EBA is doing also in terms of making more progress in terms of supervisory convergence, we're really on the way towards this cross-border European business model where we have trust and where we actually um, have a real transfer of sovereign power. Now let me go to the international dimension. And as I said, international cooperation can only come after we have our own house in order and after we have a clear vision of where we're going. 
And in terms of the international cooperation, uh, and now looking at it from the Swiss perspective, um, there is a bit of a confusion in the debate. Um, why is there confusion? Um, one is that a lot of people s confuse to some extent mutual recognition with equivalence. This is fundamentally different. Mutual uh, um, recognition is when two authorities agree and there is the, um, the principle of reciprocity which is firmly embedded in this process. And I can tell you from my experience that uh, the US definitely, for instance, in the market infrastructure um, 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 area was not that keen to mutually agree, definitely not uh, when it came to shares. The CFTC was more relaxed about mutual recognition, but definitely the SEC was quite hostile to the uh, concept of mutually agreeing anything in terms of uh, recognizing market infrastructure. And then you have equivalence, and equivalence actually has been bashed a little bit lately, but I think unfairly so, because equivalence has the merit to exist, and equivalence is legal. It is embedded in the directives and regulation that we have seen uh, through what I would call the Barney area. And it is actually a unilateral taking into account of the third country dimension, okay? And because each directive is different, each equivalence regime will be different. And of course, it's quite different to let, to um, declare a CCP equivalent as, as opposed to uh, declaring a third country on the basis of the hedge funds regulation. It doesn't embed the same stability risk. And hence, the tests that you have to apply cannot be the same. And so I think um, because of Brexit and possibly around also the, the, the questions that have been sort of in the conversation, I think we need to be a lot more precise when we use the words. And the equivalence uh, process was not designed with the idea that the United Kingdom was outside of the European Union, as the cap capital market union was not designed with the idea that London was going to be outside of the capital market in Europe. And so equivalence is a useful tool, but from my perspective, it is not a useful tool for London because when London, I would say, previously had a highway to Europe with a passport, now they will have to take very small um, little trails up the mountain through the woods. And this is not going to be uh, very useful because the other problem with equivalence, not being the tool designed to allow London to access the European capital markets is that it's unilateral, obviously, because the European Union opens the door unilaterally to the rest of the world, but can also, of course, close this. Why? It's because it's a binary decision. Once you open the door, the third country, CCP, has open game. They can provide services all over Europe. Now, what happens if the regulation changes? What happens if the stability of European markets could be called in question? Then, because it's a binary decision and because Europe, in principle, does not have the ability to control what this third country CCP is doing, you can only close the door. And so what you are actually sort of criticizing in the equivalence regime is logical because of the unilateral dimension of this instrument. And coming from the Swiss um, corner, um, we had some ideas on equivalence, but it was not changing fundamentally the equivalence regime. It was making it a little bit more predictable. Because if you want third country um, investors to access, access the European market, and you want to convince their parliament, their politicians, to have goods that will be recognized as equivalents, I think it would really help if it was spelled out more precisely what exactly it takes to be equivalent. And I have had a number of conversations with you know, politicians, notably in Switzerland, that say, but if I do A, B, C, and D, am I sure to be equivalent? And the answer is no. There is no sure way to know. And then they say, 
okay, but then I'm not going to go out there, you know, and sort of convince my colleagues, uh, you know, that it's good to change all these rules that will uh, impact the Swiss market without having any, you know, certainty that I'm on the right path. And I think that's really one of the aspects that is useful for typical third countries. Now, I'm not talking about the UK, but typical third countries, uh, the predictability of the equivalence assessment, meaning what criteria do need to be fulfilled for a country to be deemed equivalent without necessarily having the guarantee, but at least the shopping list, I think, would be very, very helpful. All right, that's it for me, and um, we look forward to the discussion.